Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Dan Winter, FractalField.com, FractalU.com, and you probably recognize who I'm with here, the very famous, very wonderful Tony Rodriguez. Thank you for Thanks. joining us. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. That was a great intro. I'll take it. Um, my, maybe, maybe it's a little over the top, but I'll take it. So happy to be here. I love our talks. You know that uh, Tony is, uh, in, in my view, one of the most articulate and uh, in-depth experiencers, the SSP, Secret Space Program Experiences, his book, um, Series, County, Series Colony Cavaliers. See, I know, I remember, I liked that book. And in the depth of Tony's memory of his time working as kind of an engineer in, in many roles with the, uh, basically the Nazi Dark Fleet, is that right, essentially? Uh, yeah, that you know, everybody, the, the term Nazi gets thrown around, and I, I think that they identified as Deutsch, dark, as mid, zero hour or midnight fleet. So dark fleet is kind of a term that's being debated these days. I remember <laughs> them calling it uh, uh, zero hour, meaning midnight, meaning that mm -hmm. they attained when they, when they, when they attained time travel. Yes. That meant that every time where they go, it's the first, it's zero hour. Aha, uh -huh. good, good to know. And so, as some of you know, that um, uh, apparently the um, the the Nazis or the the German at that time they had used the Mercury vortex they had learned from uh, studying Vimana, uh, being Hanabu, uh, and Nazi. And they basically put the the Mercury vortex in submarines. That's how they first did it, if, they, if I understood correctly. Yes. So, and there were radioactive components. So yes. I was understood that they had radioactive water steam that had been exposed that were components going through some of the larger pipes of the sh of the ship. So if that was part of the power generation or the locomotion, I don't know, but we were just doing maintenance on the bottom of the ship. I did that for quite a, quite a long time. This, this is what's very important to realize here. Here's a man, Tony, who actually was working in engineering on these ships for many years with these alternative propulsion systems have we learned something question mark about the physics and tony and I began this brainstorm a bit back we said oh well this might be a shareable wave maybe there's some pure principle here somewhere <laughs> you, you know and then from my perspective i was just a you know low level employee so in from your perspective you know the theoretical science and the science behind everything so if they marry up then that means that that is the question it's a form of evidence and Possibly a possibly breadcrumbs in the right direction. That's so, right. Does your experience fit our understanding of the physics? This is the question on the table at the moment. And I'm interested also that you mentioned when they accomplished time travel. Remember when we defined time as simply charge rotation, and that rotation rate is changes when you accelerate. So when they say you know you're warping space time, that's a crappy language. Actually, what's happening simply is if you accelerate a torus, which is mass, some of the acceleration uh, inertia is translated in vorticity affecting spin rate named time. So this is not a mystery. Uh, and in conventional physics, in phase conjugate optics, for example, when they say they did time reversal, what they essentially mean is they moved a system backwards in time only in the sense that they moved it to return to order, defined as neg entropy. So in conventional physics, you can't time reverse toward disorder. Uh, they, they haven't measured that yet. No, they've measured time reversal toward order. Uh, hello. So, but the but the other, I guess you could say, rumor we heard here, and this may have been in part in part courtesy of um, uh, Elena, was uh, that when the Nazis achieved time travel, they uh, went backwards in time and gathered a lot of resources accelerating their rate of technological evolution, uh, which is how, for example, they conquered, part of how they conquered Ceres and later became interstellar rather quickly. That's what we were told. Does that fit with you? So there is. So I I, well, I was under the impression, so I, because the question came up. So we were working on missions that we, we called it anti-telephonic. So that's a term, it's a scientific term that I, I found out later, but I remember they called anti-telephoning the missions to where they could schedule very aggressive missions, you know, in real time. So basically leaving today at 7 a.m., we'd get in the ship and fly away and they could and go to another star system and they could schedule a very aggressive mission because the ship would come back into a predetermined coordinate 
away from the planetoid that they could see five minutes before it left. So by it was a, it was a loophole in the law. So there are time travel laws throughout the cosmos yes. between societies that have the ability to time travel. So mm -hmm. there was a policing that went on. So what they determined the loophole because they got in trouble for it. They said it was my understanding that in the early years they were very aggressive about it, and when they finally got caught, that the punishment was extremely steep. In other words, the person, the director or whoever was in charge of ordering people to go back in time and gather resources, like you said, like, I don't know the specifics on that, but whoever was in charge would get taken and have to live out a horrible life for a thousand years and then return to the same moment he was taken from. And so that was the all the discouragement they needed. And they said, if you do it again, then it'll be all of you will get this. You'll get a thousand years of misery, and then we'll put you right back to this moment. So that was what that was the story that I was told. Whether that's factual, you know, I mean, I, it's up for debate. But, you know, like I said, I only had my perspective, my memories of what I saw and what I, we always ask the question, why don't you just go back in time and fix it? I want to, I, I just want to dovetail, uh, you know, finish that off what I was saying about the anti-telephoning, because it was very important. And it's a very, it's a very powerful thing. If you think about the ability for oh, a yeah. spaceship. So I use my pen. So it left series and flew to another star system at 7 a.m. And then it it didn't appear back at Ceres at 6.55 a.m. It appeared five minutes away at maximum speed as the crow flies. So it didn't actually travel time because it still had to finish the journey and it would be back exactly at 8 or 7 a.m. the same time that it left. But the people inside Ceres could see the ship. So if it came back, the, only the captain knew the coordinates that it would return to. So mm -hmm. if the ship were taken over by a hostile force, it would could appear at the wrong coordinates and they could cancel the mission on this end. And there would be an instant paradox. They said that I didn't see it personally, but it did happen on several occasions where the ship was sent out and it did come back to the wrong coordinates. And so they just scrubbed the mission. So the ship never leaves and the other ship would disappear immediately. That was the effect. They said that there was no kind of like magical special effect. The ship would immediately just disappear. And, and so that that was the anti-telephoning technique. Whenever that did happen, the authorities would ask everybody on the ship for the next few days, for the coming week, if you had any dreams about a mission that never happened, we want to hear about it. They were taking reports on what we were dreaming. Yeah. Interesting. Very important to them. That's beautiful because the physics here, we now know the physics of lucid dreaming, which is propagating in longitudinal interferometry, which is what I call it, which is the compression nodes of the array, which support teleportation, remote viewing. It's all about how a longitudinal wave can manipulate heat at a distance because in, in the stability of the array determines where you can show up in the array. So these calculations of the coordinates, for example, the physics would suggest that uh, the send and receive point are far more functional if there are natural places of charge compression in the longitudinal array. For example, we've been assured by others that when the ET set up a Stargate or portal, even on Earth, they normally do it at a place where there's a natural magnetic cross point compression line, a portal, a natural portal, because it's far more efficient. And this is also then true of the send receive point of your remote viewing team, by the way. The remote viewing has come a long way. It yeah. started out, it started out, we were doing, I researched my, I'd researched my experiences in the early days of the very first part of my 20 years when I was taken, I was on earth and I was in a program that was used for a form of remote viewing, like a kind of a different form, but for security or, um, in drug running. So when I researched that, I was try, uh, just trying to prove my account. You know, proof is everything for somebody that has, you know, testimony like mine. You ha So you have to prove it. I have to defend myself. I would never go in on stage. I would never go in front of people with all these claims if I didn't have something to back it up because it's just, you take hits. You know, I take my, I take my hits. When I started researching it, I thought here, I found a great deal of evidence. I found a great deal of things. Also, there were details that I remembered that were not in the evidence. So I started a group and we began practicing it and we were doing things like giving ourselves good luck or <laughs> healing, you know, everybody. Basically, if you can do a group that heals people that goes into a, a synchronized meditation, you get 20 people and they all 
do a synchronized meditation with a certain a combination of techniques that I learned, thank courtesy of the CIA. Um, you get a great deal of results from it. So healing was the big one. But as a as a practice mode to practice going into that state of mind, we began to remote view. Yes. And we did it very novel in a very novel way. Like, hey, let's just take a look. We weren't really serious about it. And lo and behold, we started getting incredible results. Some people were better than others. Yes. And, and not not to interrupt it, please finish. I was just going to say that uh, what we have to, to benefit by saying what we now understand about the physics of how these things work could greatly empower those people trying to do these things. A couple of reminders here that after we determine that the longitudinal EMF coherence, sometimes called scalar, we develop with plasma tubes and a phase conjugate array called therify.net doing rejuvenation, quote, time reversal, successfully commercially in 25 countries, we then learned people are regularly triggering lucid dreams directly, which basically means compress the body implosively and the body begins to emit more of its charge inertia with longitudinal compressional coherence instead of the less uh, efficiently propagating transverse EMF component. Remember, the transverse electromagnetic wave is that which goes perpendicular to the direction of propagation, all of our radio communication. However, the longitudinal component or compressional component, sometimes called scalar or torsional, goes parallel to the direction of propagation. And when that bounces at an array of nodes called fractal, at the points where it bounces, the earth grid nodes, where telepathy is proven by measurement possible, where nuclear radiate, radioactive critical mass is proven to be redu reduced, and we know why, um, this is, these are the compression nodes where longitudinal and transverse EMF are exchanging inertia, where you could, for example, contain heat at a distance and solve the holy grail of fusion physics, because you can contain heat at a distance, for example, with longitudinal microwave. So that... That representation was like the globe. You're looking at nodes on the globe. But all, the shape of DNA, Earth grid, zodiac, and every living protein. And recently, my new equation proved this is precisely, by equation, how hydrogen is built. And the reason hydrogen makes gravity as well, called implosive charge collapse. And my new book on the physics of gravity is out as of today, plonkfire.com. Check it out, P-L-A-N-C-K, Plonk. Fire, P -H -I, -R -E <laughs> I have to stop and translate you a little bit. It's it's funny because you go quickly and I kind of get what you're saying, but every now and then I have to try and translate. I think a simple animation on the implosion, yeah. a simple animation would, would be very helpful to a lot of people. It's non-destructive charge collapse. So if you take the cube octa and collapse to ecosa and you provide a trajectory for the charge collapse, which is non-destructive, which is Einstein's definition of the solution of the unified field, non-destructive charge collapse, the trajectory followed by those spir spirals, cube octa, icosa, octa, and tetra. So that charge collapse path is the physics of superconductivity and gravity. And this is a electron? Well, this is called Bucky Fuller's vector flexor jitterbug, but it is later proven to be the geometry of non-destructive charge collapse. Even Nassim is talking about that as in, for example, the only real mechanism of superconductivity is non-destructive charge collapse. So the point is that if there's a way out for the charge when it goes through center, compressed through the Planck threshold, uh, that way out is when the charge inertia translates its vorticity in it becomes a longitudinal wave coherently. Actually, maybe just a quick slide, I suppose here. <laughs> um, but so th this is a background when we then discuss shortly the gravity wave technology. I'm gonna do a share screen one sec. Let's see if I can do this keynote. Well, I wanna say a, a little bit couple, while you're doing that, um, that the remote viewing is startling. The, yes. the results we're getting on the remote viewing is absolutely startling. People are very accurate, and it's done. We're, we moved into a completely blind environment. In in the beginning, we weren't blind because it was, it wasn't about the remote viewing being accurate. It was about getting into the state of mind. Exactly. So there's, a, there's a focused state of mind that you're after that enables all these things, and so it was just practice. But now we're doing completely blind, just numbers in an envelope, and across the board, people are describing the actual verifiable target. So uh, it's amazing. There's no way, I've heard rumors of debunking remote viewing. It's just, it's just not real. It's just, remote viewing is a real thing. And if it's very easy 
for you to learn the way to do it and to immediately uh, have results. Yes. And part of that training is teaching the brain to do implosive compression. These are the brainwave harmonics we've measured just before Jean-Charles Moyen did bilocation with witnesses. So this, the brainwave harmonics here on the bottom, the alphas in green, the harmonics that are labeled in pink are golden ratio. I'm sorry, harmonics in pink are octave to the green alpha, and the harmonics in blue are golden ratio. And so basically you're making that star mother uh, tensor array uh, tetra cube inside dodecahedron, and so your 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 brain is making the compression vectors to implode charge and spit out the longitudinal wave. This is this is the preceding project when we taught kids to see without their eyes. They made the same harmonics, octave and golden ratio cascades to alpha, but Jean Charles were radically more coherent just before he bilocated, and so that ability to compress and be distributed in the array is basically based on the brain. Here, here's five golden ratio harmonics in the brain waves. This is me having bliss versus here is octave harmonics, which is a telepath at work. And these are their technologies. Notice the top of the head lights up with that coherence right here. And this is actually where you're squirting the longitudinal coherence right out the top of your head, which is what basically is behind um, Monroe Institute when they use golden ratio harmonics in binaural beats to literally... Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say that they have you imagine a toric for they have they imagine they have you imagine energy going out your feet and good energy coming in. Well, that's great. the top. I believe that that's the yes. They have you imagine sucking in good and positive energy and stale negative energy going out your feet? That's good. Breathing and, technique. And, and so this is a implosive vortex, and the squeeze point at the center is where the transverse EMF is compressed and squeezed out the toothpaste tube into coherent longitudinal propagation. And that was called the Baf and the Ka in Egypt and Kesjan body by Gurdjieff and rainbow light body by the Tibetans. But electrical engineers call it le longitudinal EMF coherence and propagating in that array, for example, that's when the children who close their eyes and they have that brainwave state, they're taught the trance, and then they see a vortex appear inside their head. It's literally a tube, they describe it that way repeatedly. And the center of that vortex tornado becomes an eyeball and they can see through it. And that is a plasma vortex, which is the physics of what you take with you when you lucid dream and when you die. And so there's some predictors here. For example, when you um, have out of body experience or lucid dream, uh, there are some places where that plasma vortex really can't go very good. An aluminum box, for example, is a horrible place. <laughs> or in a heavily saturated EM, EMF field area. So exactly. that's the Faraday cage. Yes. Well, a longitude can go through a Faraday cage, but it can't exchange inertia very well there. Actually, when Ingo Swan lit that thermistor with his mind at a distance uh, and was measured repeatedly, that's how our software came to be named flameinmind.com. He was literally making that flame in his mind and he lit a flame at a distance. And he did it in a Faraday cage. But still, the point is well taken here that once we know that your position in the longitudinal array limits your leverage. Remember Karatkov going all over the planet with Kozirev measuring, they only got military quality telepathy every time with those Kozirev mirrors, which is basically a microwave columnator. Uh, they only did it when they placed it at the magnetic earth grid line cross points, this array. These are the places they could get military telepathy, elsewhere not. I'm curious. So the first thing that comes to mind is you're establishing price pieces of real estate that are more valuable than others. Absolutely. In the array. Is, is no, it in the array. fluid? Yeah. Does it does it move or are these places that are on the earth that are that are still fixed? Well, remember, Bruce Cathy proved on the same grid, uh, harmonic 33, that uh, there was dramatic reduction in nuclear critical mass at those nodes, which was a top military secret for years, but oh crap. Uh, but it's a compression node. And because this is indirectly why, where the speed of light divides evenly the circumference and that kind of thing, the array has some movement, but it's fairly stable actually, which is why every single great pyramid, every single great labyrinth and <laughs> stone circle, they're all on the nodes of that array. They have to be. And by the way, Therify works better there too. And your remote viewing is gonna work better there too. 
uh, but there's something else we should say that predicts many other things that you can optimize by understanding the physics instead of regarding it as a, a mystery. For example, uh, sunrise and sunset, much better phase conjugate access to the array because the right angles, the, the indigenous called it the sacred four directions, but in physics is called four wave mixing and phase conjugate optics. It's also the physics of how Agni Hotra only works at sunrise sunset. So there, there are some very definite aspects to this propagating in the array. And when you did these calculations of the send and receive point in the portals, et cetera, these are all taken into account dramatically because these are the places where conjugation enables impedance matching to the longitudinal EMF array, inhabit the array. And this was later called Song Line, Dreaming Track, Heaven, Plains of Sharon, and it was also called the Collective Unconscious in the Communion of Saints. These Wait, are all- so Help well, just me understand the the phenomenon of sunset, though. Is that because you're there's a uh, an effect on the you know it's like glancing off the Earth, the you know the sunlight. What? The physics of the green flash in rainbow physics. We saw one three nights in a row in Perth, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I used to live in Hawaii. We saw them all the time. Oh, good, good. Real, okay, the time. physics of the green flash it happens only when the atmosphere is electrically coherent. And by the way, the same coherence determines whether or not rainbows happen. You know, it's well documented. It's historically scientifically documented. But when great Tibetan saints die, there are more rainbows. We're here to describe the physics of that, that actually wow. by, by uh, contributing centripetal charge coherence to their environment. The same reason down that song line of that ancestral family, when Auntie Lorraine died, the storm went across the continent on their family song line, which was a family pet. That's a magnetic line. And this is documented. Oh yeah, I got the poems. I got presentations. Anti Lorraine, the Bunjalung. It's a, it's well known in Australia. So the magnetic line across the continent becomes a family pet if you walked on it magnetically for a thousand generations and sang the song correctly. And when you put that shaman in a car going down the song line, suddenly they begin singing the song like a seventy eight, a thirty three record played on seventy eight. It's really cool. Faster. Right, because yeah. they're moving faster yeah. and the, yeah. they're, they're basically channeling it's, the song from... It's the, literally a song line, yeah. So this magnetic array, this is nothing to fool with, man. Understanding these coordinates is how you inhabit the array, and that's everything. That is the only path to actual immortality. It's the only path through death. That's why dying in electrosmog hospitals is death. <laughs> that was something that stuck with me the last time we talked. You mentioned that, that you know, dying in a hospital with all the smog, the muck, um, electric muck is not I good. guess detrimental not, yeah not detrimental optimal. to the well it's uh, the truest the same is true for birth basically if you had the alt alter at Machu Picchu that's good <laughs> but uh, but basically you need a place of leverage on the array so when they think about hospice and places designed for birth and death they're idiots if they don't if they let all the electrosmog crap in there because that it disturbs, you know, in all these pictures I have in the slideshow, but I won't dig them out now, you know, where you see the soul leaving the body and the body's floating up in their photographs. Every one of those photographs happened in the woods and not one of them happened in a hospital. Hello. The, the ancient Hawaiians. So I'm, I'm, I lived on Maui for nine years. My family's from there. And while I was there, I was looking at the old, you know, I began to uh, research, you know, pre-Hawaiian, the structure, the ancient Hawaiian and the, the, the culture, the Polynesians. And there are two structures, ancient, the largest structure in the state of Hawaii is on Maui. Uh, it's a heiau, Pi'ilani's heiau, and that is facing the sunrise. And what I found was that that's where they had babies born. Exactly. That's and it's, it's oriented to the sunrise. There's another structure that is, I don't know the name of it, but it's down the road and it's facing the sunset and it's on a cliff. And that's where they had sacrifice. They were exactly. killing people totally. at that, you know, the criminals that got killed got killed at that heyout and it was facing, it was at sunset. So yeah. and I was researching cannibalism, you know, ritual human sacrifice. Why do they do, do that? And I was shocked when I learned that it was a global phenomenon all the way up until Christianity. So like you said, the, well, the, the muck and the sunset that they were choosing, it might not have been so macabre or so dreadful, to, to to know that you were mortally wounded or or mortally right. ill and choose your mo the optimum moment of your death that this may have been going on in these ancient cultures 
and they had a place for that to have it. So yeah. that's when we drove up 90 mile beach to the north tip of new zealand and they said this is where the native people went to die and they could propagate from here you know so mm. su the sunrise and sunset have perpendicular vectors and the green flash is the coherence that's enabled that by that phenomena basically it's it, it's important to know that the reason color exists is phase conjugation the physics is at fractalfield.com slash fractal photosynthesis Real quick question. So are you more worried about the photonic energy or the magnetic energy that's coming from the sun in that direction, in that instance? Remember, the phase conjugation is broad spectral, and it's all made of the same stuff. It's called charge, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> those are different spectrum. Uh, and magnetic phase conjugation is as powerful as optical. Most Very few people know that. But it's the fact that it's broad spectral. For example, when you put a copper square on the roof and a wire to the basement and the basement is pitch black but the longitudinal wave arrives in the basement the plants will grow just fine in the pitch dark that's the longitudinal energy of the sun being delivered to your basement and well, i didn't know that oh yeah i wish i would have known that before i killed so many plants in my house <laughs> and also that's why uh you need to get the damn moon out of the way if you want a seed to germinate or a child actually because the moon being hollow and metal has the wrong dielectric but, uh, speak of the devil. Well, no, no. The Andromeda, the Federation had to stick it in here to stabilize after the lesser dryad, and you know. But, but yeah, anyway. I always say to people, if you think of the moon as a craft that can move things, that can turn on and change its gravity, gravitational force, it's an extremely powerful, extremely useful. It's yeah. a it's a solar system tractor. So yeah. they can move the orbits of things around macro objects. There's a great deal of things and in my time in the secret space program, we were aware that the moon had one of the greatest uh, sources of power, of artificial power. Like it put out more power than all most of the other colonies um, that we did. So there was there were exotic technologies that were only on the moon because of power output. So whatever's powering it, I don't know, but we were all aware that certain technologies couldn't work anywhere else but the moon because of the generator that it, that it had. We're going to talk about the crystal energy technology here. I actually have a slide about that. But but just first, have we finished the conversation about um, the fact that the longitudinal inter interferometry is predictive to remote viewing, for example? The other point I wanted to make was that the children who just finished going to that brainwave state, trance bliss, and then they can repeatedly see without their eyes, uh, many of them... Uh, kind of scare the hell out of their parents because they start seeing their ancestors. Very common, well known in the East. This is taught at the New Zealand school for seeing that. So, Interesting. I have a quick question about the bliss. So we had talked before and I mentioned that, you know, the same way that you can remember a song, the same way that you can recall the lyrics of a song, that is that, can you go into the state of bliss the same way? Can you remember a time that you were blissful and create the wave of bliss? Or do you actually have to be in genuine bliss i mean do you have to eat a chocolate bar or find whatever it is you know like do you actually have to generate bliss that way or can you just remember recall the emotion the same way you would a song <laughs> no that that's good well another way that skill was classically taught when karatka first measured kids seeing without their eyes and discovered golden ratio in brain waves flame and uh one of the techniques they they used was um the kids would close their eyes and they would imagine themselves in beautiful nature. And in that moment, it was like flick, flipping a switch. Just the imagination that they were sitting in beautiful nature, their brain waves would go golden ratio and their body would start imploding. <laughs> so that's the that's one of the, Flip the switch. ways to do that. Yeah. So, so that is, in a way, you're imagining, but that is like playing a recording. Well, it, exactly. That's the point. And remember, you see, it, you know, the baby might be happy the first time you stick the pacifier in its mouth, but the second time and it realizes there ain't no milk there. <laughs> right. There's less, much less bliss. <laughs> so the, the point is your body is correct to start imploding when it enters beautiful nature, like uh, Luke Skywalker, when he became a Jedi, uh, because Implosion is the way you project the plasma coherence called the raising of the Jed, actually, and the Jed Towers of Egypt similarly. This was called Boson 7, microcritians in the blood and all that. So plasma projective, but a particular kind of plasma projective, which is called longitudinal coherence, also how the Star Wars saber worked, actually. 
So, um, but your your question is, you know, how can you trigger the bliss? <laughs> is it more than chocolate bar? I like that question. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's a very important uh, for one. And for two, I'm starting to draw. So when we talk about the remote viewing, so I have a group, the people that participate, not only in the remote viewing, but in the manifesting, the synchronized meditation, we synchronize on the target. And we, lo and behold, we got excellent results. So, you know, we kind of stumbled upon it. I, fortunately, I had people watching my show that were, that could digest that kind of information and participate. So it's a much higher, and we meet every week and do this. Um, going into that, I'm starting to wonder, th these are people from all over the world, like a lot, most of the people in America, but there are people from Europe, there are people from, the, the Europeans have a hard time making the late uh, meetings. You know, at the 8 p.m.s is very late in Europe, so um, we tend to not retain them because it's, it's you know, on Tuesday night. But what I'm starting to think now is that maybe the people that are very proficient in the remote viewing group and in this group live in an area that you're describing. Well, so, they, so it's if, different. And it seems like people get hot and cold. So it's not always yes. some people have very accurate remote views. And then the next time they're kind of off. And, you know, we all live hectic lives, so that's we don't know exactly what's causing it. But, but the people that are consistently accurate, I'm starting to wonder if they live in an area that they can go into that state of mind much quickly or if they're just <laughs> profoundly psychic. Well, so that's the point that we would like to now make a list of the factors which determine, for example, uh, if you're supposed to make a magnetic med map first of your bed, then your house, then your yard, and then your village. And when you're done, you rearrange the magnetic lines in each case to look like a rose, and then you're done. So what that what that means actually is enabled compression, fractality actually. And so obviously, if your bed is at a magnetic cross point, you have a lot more leverage. Another thing we said about the SSP experiencers, we hypothesized, even in your case, that, you know, we know that about 90% of the abductees after the Griotta Treaty were people who had some indigenous blood. And we believe it was because they're more likely to be lucid dreamers, which means they're more likely to be longitudinally coherent, which means they have the DNA that the bad guys don't. <laughs> which is called boson-7 or microcaridians, which basically is longitudinally coherent implosion in the DNA, which means susceptible to bliss, but also after bliss. For example, you can douse because then you feel magnetic lines. I can I can feel magnetic lines at great distance, actually, myself. I'm not clairvoyant, but I'm you, clairaudient. You explained the, that to me last time we talked, and I haven't tried it yet. I've been on the road, and I, uh, I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of almost afraid. You know, some and most of the time in my life, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of success because it changes. You might your life. be sensitive. Maybe you're right, sensitive. Because... Uh oh, that that means you know a, a a bad dowser moves the water vein back into the well with a hammer and percuss, but a good dowser moves the water vein back into the well by talking to the magnetic line. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's an entire subject i've got to research and and look into the dowsing uh, yeah it is but, a real thing yeah so th this is to say that the access to that grid you could make a list of factors if you had some indigenous blood more likely your ancestors walked the same magnetic line for a thousand generations and so those magnetic lines are more closer to being a family pet basically and uh also if you uh are living near magnetic line cross, if you do it at the right time of day. Uh, the ability to lucid dream is a predictor of many of these things. Uh, so you could begin to do a few questionnaires. So effectively, we're saying that longitudinal coherence is a determiner, not just of lucid dreaming and remote viewing, but we know, we're pretty sure that lucid dreaming skill predicts who will have a successful death. Wow, uh, successful. I think we're all going to succeed at it. Uh. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> success is well-defined. It's the ability to take memory through death, which is basically to a survive compression acceleration to inhabit the array. And it's interesting that we know Swaru, for example, who became basically Borg, did too damn much time travel and scrambled her eggs. And uh, yeah, then she was, then they tried to reconstitute her memory from the shipboard computer. You know, that's called soullessness. And that's exactly what we're trying to avoid by teaching the mistakes. <laughs> so I wonder if this is part of the ancient technology, re retaining your memory through death is something exactly. that the ancients learned and, exactly. and mastered. And, and, and absolutely part, mastered it. And these are the people that are running things now. 
Well, but in part of the how the plot thickens here, I was so proud when my prediction that Earth would be the vaccine for the Orion Wars. And then Elena says, oh, yeah, the three tall grays they captured after screwing with Eisenhower are the ones they used to poison the Orion Queen. And the Orion F Nabu Federation fell apart. So we were the vaccine for the Orion Wars. It did work that way. <laughs> but the point I was, wanted to make was that those grays, the reason they abducted only basically the lucid dreamers was a clue to what DNA they were trying to steal. And guess what their problem was? Soullessness, effectively, that, you know, the Draco culture, we believe, had recognized, you know, thousands of years ago, that they were losing long-term memory, actually. Mm. And that's that's why I think the Draco was named Charlie, who ran Montauk. I talked to the chief time empath about this why they abducted only the teenagers who could lose a dream to steer the time chair. Well, steering the time chair at Montauk required that same skill to navigate in the lucid dream, basically, which is superluminal and requires longitudinal coherence. Hmm. Interesting. So like when you would have that, like you said, longitudinal co coherence, you're actually in touch with the whole universe, the whole the array. Once you're out of sight of time space. Well, you're accessing time and space, all of it at once. So, and then somebody that couldn't soulless this would be somebody, and this this falls right into the uh, philosophy of the people that are service to self are they feel themselves separated from all, from all of creation, so that there's no problem doing immoral things because they're they're personally the creation they're separated from it, and people that have this this ability are in contact, so they become service to others, and the. So, the Yes, perfect. well said, but we believe, for example, this term outside time and space is really not very helpful electrically, but it, we agree with you completely what you're saying about the physics of compassion. So when we taught, you know, I invented the term heart coherence and how to measure it, heart coherence, real heart coherence .com. And basically the heart turns inside out recursively and that implosion, I developed the mathematics to measure and taught Heart Math Institute. Um, and that onset of heart coherence is basically implosion of the EKG. And it's the beginning of the compassion because it's the beginning of the ability to turn inside out electrically or implode, actually. And the reason that that defines empathy and is directly related to the physics of ensoulment mm -hmm. is because it's at the implosion point, you get that, it's called impedance matching, coupling into the compression nodes of the array. And so it, when you touch the center of the compression of that array and you can handle stillness, like Daniel Brinkley inhabiting lightning after in three near-death experiences, you know, when you can access the still point in that array, suddenly you're coupled to it, which is why the greatest Templar initiation was always three days dead. They, you know, they you know, called it the lost art of resurrection. But it, basically it's the ability to go through a still point and that couples you to the array, and that's called initiation, actually. So you're calling it not outside of time and space. You're calling no. it the the array. Yes, but I'm. Yeah, calling it outside time and space is useless language. It doesn't it doesn't tell you anything? No. I think I read that somewhere. I think I, know, I read people, that in a in a um, what do you call it? A report based on the Gateway Project. Yeah. Well, so they it, were trying to summarize, summarize it. it that's why I use it's that. like a biologist using the word instinct because the word instinct is their their word for we don't have a clue. Well, actually, mm. <laughs> saying it's outside of time space just means well we really are clueless about this, so we're going to invent some dumb words. So it's inside time space, but it's the array of time space that you're accessing it's the entire to, array. Access to the leverage of those compressant points, the nodes. So see, at those nodes there's a cascade of harmonics and those harmonics are golden ratio multiples times C, the speed of light, somewhat documented by Professor Raymond Chow's dominant measures of all velocities faster than life centered right around golden ratio times the speed of light. Hello, that is proof smoking gun. And so the, when you do this time travel, the more leverage you get on the nodes of that array, the more ability you can propagate at higher and higher multiples of the speed of light in the array. That's why you know, the Orion Wars were over the Stargate, the trapezium, because more compression there, that Stargate could go further. So those nodes, I mean, if I'm understanding this right, because I know that when you go into the state of mind, you have access to, there is time, like distance doesn't matter, isn't it? So there, so the speed of light isn't really... It is not a speed limit. Doesn't no. apply. It's it's basically you're act you're accessing the entire array simultaneously. That's right. To the in extent. other words, you push on one end, it can be anywhere on the other. 
So it's all a, a, like a live array. So the yeah. array is connected. It's like one medium. These these are like still points. And when you touch one point here, the point on the other side feels it directly. And that's and all feeling, of them. Yeah, it, it, that, that feeling connection between the one point and the other point is limited by how still the compression point is at each node. So visualize e each node as the center of a pine cone kissing noses. The bigger the pine cones kissing noses there, and of course the pine cones kissing noses in the heart of Orion trapezium square cube four-way fixing, that is a good stargate, man. <laughs> that was a, uh, that was a big place. It was, it was. Yeah, we have, was, actually, maybe this is an excuse to play the slides here since we have all those slides actually cooked up for this conversation. So let me see if I can do this right. So uh, slide numbers 20 to 52, just, so the idea, this part of the conversation was to compare Tony's experience with dot, dot, dot. So this is, this is what uh, the Arcturians called planet taming, planting the uh, pyramids at tetrahedral latitudes. And it phase locked the Earth's spin rotation with zodiacal rotation. And so the zodiacal rotation can cascade like a caduceus into the Earth's spin rotation, stabilizing gravity and atmosphere called planet taming. Effectively, the, the, the pyramid in that case is literally a gravity diode. But a uh, point here on the bottom, you see, the armature in this spinning uh, craft is merely delivering a high voltage to a concave surface, which is um, the Searle principle, and that delivers a longitudinal component. This, which is a gravity wave. This is this is top right how phase conjugation works, and this is the trapezium cube in Orion, the big stargate, and this is the double vortex. Hold on a second. Could you go back to the previous one? And so the top right how the cone vortex works. So that's your pine cone. Now, well, that's, are those? That's how lasers phase conjugate. That's called four wave mixing. And note the golden ratio optimizes. Yes. So is this? A, I'm I'm just curious. Is it x? Is it coming out or going towards the center? These waves. Well, it, actually, you know, the lasers are it would appear to be converging towards center. What emerges from the compression point is no charge can pass through that center compression point without being sorted into phase. And that's why if you have bliss, you can you dump your astral parasites, for example. But I mean, like a laser, it, like putting the photons in an, in a well, this is order. pure pure phase conjugate optics. The lasers have to meet in a very accurate cube, and when they do, they have to meet in a superconducting medium called phase conjugate dielectric barium strontium titanate, which is charge distribution permissive to enable the pine cones to kiss noses and touch accurately at the Planck threshold where the conjugation implosive compression occurs. And that's where the sorting happens, called negentropy, the title. It's, it's funny that a lot of the people in the early CIA people, uh, CIA research uh, projects, uh, grill flame that morphed into center lane, that morphed into Stargate, were all laser guys. Uh, there you go. They had a clue, but not one of them could answer you why they needed a, a phase conjugate dielectric at the center point, because they didn't know that. But phase conjugate dielectrics then are also how you know, Nostradamus made his scrying and how Jean D talked to angels. It's phase conjugate mirror physics, actually. And that's how the Olmec communicated with ancestors in the obsidian mirror. It's literally a phase conjugate. That's why when kids start phase conjugating, they can see their ancestors. So an obsidian mirror wouldn't let uh would wouldn't let any kind of energy pass through it. Well, the obsidian mirror is a way of coupling with a longitudinal array, enabling you to see your ancestors. But there still could definitely be some astral hygiene problems there. And more natural way to do this was, you know, the circle of shaman went into trance. And by their intent, they determined that no bad ancestors made phone calls. You know, So there's definitely astral hygiene issues. So this, this is the lens lensing of the Orion classical called Antarian conversion. This is the actual oh, geometry. Wow. Holy moly. The actual geometry of the star masses around Orion. So you see why. And this was called Yod Hey Vahe, because it's actually two light cones, Yahweh. And the Yahweh was just a name for a title of those who can inhabit a big plasma vortex. It doesn't mean that en Enlil Yahweh qualified. No, he was a wannabe. But but so this is the Antarian conversion. I'll, you know, so you can see the Stargate physics fits the metaphor. And we've got all and these. that's an extremely so for people that may not think about it that's an extremely huge 
area of space. Absolutely big. So but when you're talking about waves that are the size of the solar system. Yeah, the are size enabled of, by that. Like big, big chunk of the size of the galaxy. And the, so there's a gravitational lensing, and the climax point of gravitational lensing is phase conjugation, which actually is where the centripetal force actually holds the galaxy together, you know, mm -hmm. black holes becoming intelligent. This this is what's called Peshme 10, the way of the nine by the Hopi, and later became Deep Space Nine and the return of the nine, the, the plasma physics, and we have more slides later on. That. So anyway, this is the alpha doorway. So this is the, the change the subject slightly, the Egyptian Jed, you see the Jed Tower is plasma projective because the piezo is implosive capacitively. And so that, that that means is, and this then, if you take this in the next, you know, axis of symmetry, this actually is how DNA works to project the jet, which is, you know, longitudinal coherence. During bliss, your DNA does all the same stuff. So your DNA is spitting out. And the geometry of Charlie's East, the, the, the angle of 76 degrees was- Hold a it right there. So you're, you're covered a lot of distance here, but on this one, uh, on that other one with the this one so the angle of these what is the angle on this a 76 degree uh is the peak angle of the uh it's the base angle of the egyptian pyramid and the peak angle of the russian pyramids in both cases it's so golden ratio could phase conjugate the implosive capacitance and project a longitudinal which is what a gravity wave is made of which is why the pyramid could be a gravity diode also how the pyramid could take the what's called phase conjugate pump wave, golden ratio times Planck, which is the Schumann harmonics, and dump out the longitudinal that became an effective functional global wireless power grid. Tesla had the frequencies and the nodes wrong. So a lot of crystal breaks on, I believe it's 52 or 51 and a half degrees. Yeah. And the Great Pyramid is at the same degree. So is that a, another version of this same math that's kind well, that of- That 51 at the base, angle? but that, that, that 51 at the base uh, produces the 76 at the top and vice versa. So it basically in both cases, the angle was designed to allow precisely golden ratio implosion. And th that implosion does this, the transverse comes in at one side on the left here and goes down the vortex called Caduceus Hermes. See, now I'm seeing an effect of like a Vogel crystal. Well, so see the, the, Vogel, the, the, the Vogel crystal piezo quartz is pure hex. And will not dump out anything longitudinal until there's a golden ratio phase conjugate pump wave, which is your own bliss. So Marcel <laughs> could not affect the plant on the polygraph until he actually made bliss in his own brain waves. I was that's there. why love works the best out of it. So <laughs> to try to use a vocal crystal to 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 hate somebody doesn't, no. <laughs> doesn't work out. Well, okay. but but later we'll we'll use that as a lesson to learn what piezo how piezo crystals like Kosky Frost made 800 times their own weight. And that's the only real introduction to warp propulsion, which is later in the slideshow that understanding. So the, the point is that when the compression has the right geometry, then the transverse on the left becomes longitudinal on the right. And that's what a gravity wave is made of. I don't know, you probably know. Of much like a laser, much like light does in a yes. laser. Yeah, the, so at the, at the squirt gun tip, which is called Planck, the transverse translation of vorticity spits out longitudinal. And this is Bearden's book of equations showing that longitudinal waves are what gravity waves are made of. So you're making basically making gravity. It's a gravity diode. So this is the transverse wave versus the longitudinal. So longitudinal compression is in the direction of wave propagation. And that compression wave would go through about anything. So a transverse, uh, excuse me, a transverse wave is basically how most waves occur in nature. Well, actually, there the orderly, more disciplined longitudinal component is compressed is present, particularly on the Earth grid nodes, et cetera. But your physics electro electrical engineering teacher only knows how to use the transverse comp component for communication because they're idiots. <laughs> no, I, I let me oh, say <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, na nature uses the longitudinal component for communication. It's called DNA radio, but your local electrical engineer don't have a clue. <laughs> Which is why they don't subscribe to the science. So they don't subscribe to the ESP Which, and all these things don't exist to them. Which means until we can explained. teach your university and government what a soul is, everyone on earth is doomed to be the Borg. So let's hurry up and do it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because, you know, you can't make intelligent decisions as a government, you know, what the physics of soul is, and the physics of soul is precisely longitudinal coherence.
So when the longitudinal waves implode compressively, that's when you get, uh, for example, nuclear critical mass. And uh, so this, the reason Schauberger got voltage from gravity, there was a voltage difference between the widest point and the narrowest point. And that's, that's a pressure difference. And that vortex had to be piezoelectrically doped. And that's an introduction to the mercury vortex that you saw. Vimana. So that's exactly what I saw. Well, it was different. It was in a glass cylinder. But you know what else I saw was there were other, there was another version where it had smaller vortexes in a nearby it along the bottom. Yeah. Like other vortexes that were going around at the bottom of it. And were they, some well. of those vortex had a perpendicular axis? You mean the, the same exact, the same? No, some or... of the vortex went this way and some of them went this way, right? Attitude control? You know, I just glanced at it for a short time and I was very impressed. Like I was being hurried through the door and they had the cover off the motor. And that's what I saw. And I just remember that the color that it was, it was lit up. There was light throughout the liquid and it was a, a purple, I want to say bluish purple, but um, there were several vortexes. I remember that there was a large one arranged just like this. And there were several other vortexes around the bottom of it in a separate, I believe it was a separate tank, but I only glanced at it and I was, I was impressed by it and kind of moved on, you know? Yeah. So uh, but it's, it's wonderful that you remember. So what we conclude that, I mean, the classic description of Hanabu Vimana Nazi Bell is two counter-rotating large cylinders, and in the gap between them, uh, the liquid mercury was doped with an iron powder, which it was a special wetting agent, and uh, then you had the, it became red, which might be the purple you saw, and that re famous red uh, mercury, and the iron powder made magnetic flux permissivity parallel to the uh, uh, specific gravity hydraulic flux uh, density of the mercury. And in both cases, the hydraulic inertia and the magnetic inertia, when they would converge at the correct angle at the throat of that vortex, the inertia would be translated into a longitudinal wave emitting out the bottom directionally, which is producing gravity. The key is to understand that when you compress transverse at the correct compression angles, uh, that implosion translation of vorticity will produce longitudinal EMF coherence directionally. And that is the beginning of making gravity, actually. Uh, so something that's never really said about the UFO, the disk UFO phenomenon. It's very rarely, I've very rarely heard it. And it's very rare. But the disk doesn't fly like a Frisbee. No. It flies going, like the top of it is going forward. The disk flies in that direction. Yeah. That's and what I remember. Yes, and um, so the uh, ability to to steer uh, has to do with minor changes in the orientation of that vortex, which has to be ex controlled exquisitely magnetically, I would assume. And it's just like uh, trying to control your flight with just a squirt gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, but the, so the idea is the basic physics here is that producing a longitudinal wave in one direction, directionally, is precisely what gravity is made of. And the reason is because that produces the experience of acceleration uh, and it's asymmetrical. It's going in one direction down the center of that vortex. And so the fast, so the fastest craft they had, we called a double disc and it was more of a figure eight. Uh, it was two of them. Uh -huh. oh, yes. that, was, that was much faster than the single one. But now I'm starting to look at the cylinder design and think maybe that's why they were way more maneuverable. So well, the ship, the cargo ship that I was on was extremely maneuverable. Like uh, there was only a few instances where I looked out, I could look out the window and once I was on the bridge and it maneuvered extremely well. Like not like you would think a squirt gun, but it probably had several of these outputs, like two, you, two or four squirt guns. Well, and look here, you see the three at the bottom, you could triangulate, that's one possibility. Um, but yes, the maneuverability. And remember, this is crude by comparison to the warp, uh, the crystal propulsion, which is next in the series. But just the idea that once you understand the production of coherent longitudinal EMF directionally, then you don't have to be an idiot about these things and instead start thinking about the physics. And 
I, I wanted to make it make the make the point here that I mean that humans are are so primitive that because not knowing why an object falls to the ground really puts this planet last on the on the ladder of understanding any kind of science. It's ex extremely excruciatingly disgusting. You know these yeah. physicists running around well, thinking it's on oh, purpose. <laughs> You know, and that the fact that the myth of not knowing why objects fall off the ground propagates all of physics on this planet is absolutely nauseating. I, excuse me, but I, you know, that I think Maurice Cotterell said it once. Well, well, <laughs> they seem to be pretty arrogant for not having a clue why an object falls off the ground. <laughs> I think they figured it out in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then they closed the door behind them because they understood how what an advantage it would give them. The yeah, Beard, Bearden understood, absolutely. I just want to point out that we actually have equations now, fractalfield.com slash propulsion, for the angle of the white, of the wrap factor around the torus to, to optimize the amount of propulsion, and then more in the solid state direction. So once you understand phase conjugation, here is the famous EM drive, and you see in the background the, this uh, brass-shaped trapezoidal cone, and uh, the microwave is cascading in a caduceus. And now we know that if you retuned that to using my equation, Planck and Golden Ratio, you could optimize the amount of gravity you're making because the microwave is imploding, conjugate, conjugating directionally. And at, the, at that implosion point, you make some longitudinal. And that's the reason the EM drive flies. It's really quite simple physics. That may be another reason why we see the trapezoid in a lot of the structure, like the symbol symbology of the secret space program throughout the cosmos, throughout the, oh. excuse me, throughout the solar system built out that we see the trapezoid built in. Um, it may represent this. Imploding trapezoid. Yes, very good. And this is just, you know, when you spin the gyroscope and nutate precess at the right phase angle, you can radically speed up the gyroscope by phase locking this, the high speed spin with the precession rate and that phase lock will speed it up. So that's the reason you need things like pyramid gravity diodes to phase lock Earth spin to zodiacal spin. You stabilize that cascade, which stabilizes gravity and atmosphere. This was Hermes, basically, the Thoth, who has come back in Florida, I think. And they called this planet taming. And it's because there's a narrow uh, uh, tightrope between too much gravity and no life and too little gravity and no atmosphere to, to massage that tightrope you use planet taming which is this nutation precession phase lock which is basically what one of the pyramids major function it would accelerate evolution so you're so saying they could adjust the actual amount of gravity on the earth well remember the pyramids are a gravity diode they're making longitudinal and they're pumping around that longitudinal wave around the planet that's a global wireless power and it worked they were at longitudinal nodes but uh, there was another function. It had to do with re restoring atmosphere at a time when, you know, half the planets of the solar system just lost theirs. Hello, <laughs> Mars included. You know, they just screwed with the solar system bad. So they had work to do. And this was to stabilize, you know, planetaries. And this was, you know, this was called planet taming. This was called the cedars. That's what that, that's what their job was. This, this is, um, I think we had this conversation before, but, this is just an image which Elena says is approximate of what which craft is this? Do you remember this? The uh, um I'm not sure. Uh Excelsior, maybe? I'm not sure. Maybe. But um in, in most cases it's visualized with a giant crystal up the center. And um we believe that this nodal array here that looks like carbon fullerene is actually a super dielectric delivering a phase conjugate pump wave which is a gravity maker. And that's where we're getting to the concept of what is warp propulsion. And you can read the book at fractalfield.com slash propulsion. Thanks to Bill Donovan, now Elizabeth Donovan, gl glimpses of epiphany, crystal propulsion. So he was he wrote a book about this Kosky Frost device. This is the Kosky Frost device, made 800 times its own weight in gravity. And the phase conjugate pump wave looked like a caduceus, literally um, the Schumann cascade. And so, this is what you're doing is you're pumping an implosive cascade that looks like a caduceus up the Z axis. This is the top straight C axis shown here of a quartz crystal. And the phase conjugate pump wave in Marcel's case, it was his own brain waves. Um, and that, so then the, he, the helix would begin to implode. It's naturally piezoelectric. Piezo just means that compression on the side axis converts to 
voltage on the perpendicular axis. And so when that cascade of harmonics of the phase conjugate caduceus pumps that the Cosy frost crystal um, expanded dramatically and then made 800 times its own weight in gravity. And this is just so, an introduction. Wait, of wait in, in that last previous slide with the girl in the chair. So you're saying the box in the center is crystalline? This was um, the Science and Invention magazine, uh, 1927. And that was a fantasy on the left, uh, gravity conquered. But on the right is actual pictures of what was being done. You had an RF wave pumping into a crystal at the center. That's a quartz crystal cube in that case. And um, uh, we think things like barium strontium titanate or lithium niobate, you know, Scotty's dilithium crystals would be more efficient and because they're more efficient piezo electric. So this is, a, we're looking at a, what they, you know, I always use the techno, the terminology, what they claimed to be an anti-grav device in 1927. That's right. Oh, yeah. That, that This was, and it's also documented that the U.S. government had a lot of trouble to remove that publication from every university library in the country, we're pretty sure. Um, so I wonder why. <laughs> well. Uh, oh, wait, and this one, I have a quick question about the, the the lattice mark. So on the left, is that what the structure of a crystal looks like? At that, the so this level? is a, this is a model of silicon dioxide, SiO2, which nests tetracubically. And if you ratchet that tetracube up a helix, that's called quartz with a hex shadow. So a quartz it, has these organized in a helix that goes from one end of, so right. it does have a grain to it. Yes, that's absolutely. That's what produces the correct cut and helps the Vogel effect. Well, yeah. And what Marcel, you know, I was in with IBM at the time also, and, and I quizzed Marcel on this because I we we knew the Atlantean fire fire crystal physics at the time. And the, the way to align the uh, facet plane with the molecular plane, uh, Marcel really was not aware, but you have to use the uh, birefringence of the Z axis, which rotates the plane of polarized light in order to accurately model where the the facet planes are to get them aligned with the molecular planes. And so you had to find the grain of the crystal. You had to find the accurate Z axis, the vertical axis here, and you find it by that axis will most rotate the plane of polarity of polarized light. And it's called birefringion in the case of quartz because it splits it into two parallel planes of rotation. And using those two as interferent versus referent is how um, the famous Raymond Royal Rife uh, developed the Rife microscope in which he saw things smaller than the wavelength he was using to look at birefringion. So this is the dilithium crystal story and Scotty blow the die. And this is when Cashy- is carbon. Well, you see, this is just to show that if you rotate a conjugator, this is- There's a, our sine waves for both. Well, if you see, put that slide back, so there's sine waves there. Yeah, okay. So so that if you, if you, um, the Buckminster Fullerene looks like this model, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's carbon. And if you rotate that, you know, Keshe's car floated actually, rotating a conjugator. So if you can make fullerene, if you can make carbon nano pure enough, everything else on this planet looks like the Stone Age's energy and propulsion, actually. And so this is an introduction to call, it's called rotating conjugators. And the metaphor in the warp propulsion, Kosky Frost, and how the crystal craft warp propulsion works, is that it effectively becomes a rotating conjugator because the z-axis helix of that quartz, the slinky, um, is rotating, the helix is a but and then it's a conjugator if there's a phase conjugate pump wave present. Visualize the caduceus, which is Golden ratio times Planck, and and that's in the case of human bliss is dumping that infrasound in to modulate the piezo crystal. In the Therify, we dump the infrasound of human bliss into plasma, and we do rejuvenation. It's called a phase conjugate pump wave. It's the technical term. It's just a wave shape, a caduceus based on Golden ratio times Planck. Does the uh... So I'm just curious how many times you have to times the Planck times Golden ratio before you get up to a measurable distance, like an inch or a centimeter, for instance. Like, uh, how many how many levels of Golden ratio are you out from a Planck? It's got to be quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, here's I think the equation is here. So this is um, Planck times Golden ratio in seconds in hertz. Uh, there's a similar table for for 
inches. But uh, just to give you an idea, the British foot, remember this charge collapse defines the concept of sacred in general as per proven by the fact that the British foot, which is the basis of all other sacred lengths actually, um, is exactly golden ratio to the 164th power times Planck, actually. But not the meter, not on the metric, but in the no, imperial. Yeah, I was kind of best with John Michel, who dedicated his life to that problem to try to prove the, me the meter is evil. <laughs> actually, what he, <laughs> what, what he simply proved was that charge collapse is enabled with golden ratio times Planck, which enables Nick entropy, which defines the sacred. So we know exactly what sacred dimension is. And now we're using that and we teach biologic architecture around the planet using that bioarchitects.net. So here are multiples of golden ratio times Planck from three exact radii of hydrogen, dienstein diphosphate, the photosynthesis. So we're at a hundred and million, a hundred million times. Yeah, right? well, it, it's- Versus to get- It's- um, So- get the hydrogen size. Yeah, so the golden ratio, the 240th power is the Venus year and Earth year, actually times Planck time, to give you an idea. So, but the point is that only nodes on that array, on that line, are negentropic. That's called Origin of Biologic Negentropy, the title of my book. And this is an example of a phase conjugate pump wave. In blue is the exact equations, and this is in Hertz, and in green, are the actual harmonics of the Schumann cascade. You see the Schumann cascade, 3 hertz, 7.8, 3, 14, and 20, approximates a phase conjugate pump wave. And that's why the pyramids could make global wireless power. They were called the Hummer for that reason. So the reason I asked that question is like I, I want kind of people to understand how incredibly small a plank is. It's, it's 1. 1.61 1. times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, actually. Yeah, sounds big. But it's it's a lot. It's mind-bogglingly small. The reason, the other reason being is like for my own purposes, I consider the Planck a pixel, like the way that we look at a screen, a TV screen. The pixels have a certain size to them. The pixel to our universe, to our to what you're looking at, the pixel is the size of a Planck, which is ridiculously small. You're looking at the yeah. most resolution screen that we've that could, we can imagine exactly right the Planck exactly. is so small and these are pixels of the universe well said the time and light are locked into these pixels the distance of these pixels and so but, the illusion is that it's so um, well said well said and but the point being here is that since Planck is the same for thousands of light years in all directions, there's got to be a reason. And that reason ain't the Big Bang. No, that reason is because that's how gravity propagates. Hello. Because <laughs> that's the minimum that well, it would be. The Planck is the threshold at which compression can impedance match the longitudinal array and therefore stabilize gravity, which is why the golden ratio is the dominant geometry of all orbital mechanics. I repeat, all orbital mechanics. Hello, is that a smoking gun for the cause of gravity? <laughs> I'm curious. Now I want to talk to an astrophysicist because are they aware of that? Like on the orbital mechanics, are they aware? Are they using golden well, ratio in the, their studies uh, Sp of Spira galaxies and such? Spirasolaris.ca, a whole big website proving the dominant geometry of all orbital... You know, they proved that the geometry of all masses in the universe is the dodecahedron. And then they proved that the universe is fractal. Then they proved that the geometry of the ether is golden ratio. Then they proved the earth grid is dodecahedral and the geometry of DNA and then the geometry of hydrogen. It's all it's been smaller. golden ratio for a reason. From the spiral galaxy all the way down. All the way down, up and down, upward. wherever you go. It's called scale invariance. And Einstein had a clue. He said, non-destructive compression is the solution of the unified field. He was right. He didn't know what a fractal was. And he certainly didn't know what a fractal field was. But once you do know what a fractal field is, then you know the cause of gravity because you know the cause of non-destructive compression. And direct your scientist friend to PlankFire.com, please. Yes. Uh, well, um my scientist friend, whatever, that's a different story. I want to bring something up. You you mentioned Einstein. So did we call it a wormhole? Are yes. you calling so, these portals? Did, am, did my ship go through an Einstein-Rosen bridge wormhole? Or was yeah, it some other phenomenon that it was using to jump specifically? They yeah, had to spin up. They had to save a great deal of power. And they generated an, I, what I believe was an Einstein-Rosen bridge and jumped immediately to other star systems. Was that uh, what you... Yeah, I think... The people who conventional physicists say that entanglement connects you to an Einstein Rosen bridge, which is not wrong, it's just stupidly inaccurate language. The correct language would be entanglement 
perfected is the definition of phase conjugation. Hello, which is what produces entanglement. And what they're calling Einstein-Rosenbridge is because they don't have a, a clue what an array is because Einstein's sitting there like a dummy saying action at a distance is spooky because he didn't know what a longitudinal wave was. He didn't know what an ob object falls to the ground. So he didn't know what non-destructive compression was. Use the golden ratio to predict what the, uh, excuse me, what the fabric of space-time was doing at the other end. And exactly. And that same thing and create the hole on both sides and go. That's what's going connection on. Connection to the array, which is a connection to Through the- the array, array, that's right. Yeah, it's a connection to the enabled compression points. That's the key language here because the longitudinal node is enabled compression where compression is non-destructive. That's why there's such a dramatic difference in nuclear critical mass at the magnetic So line. they're causing a compression point on one end and an identical one at the- Yes, and it has to be- absolutely frequency matched send to receive point to work. It's just, it's actually the same way IP works. The packets bounce all around, but they got to find the one with the address that matches. It's actually re remarkably parallel to IP. And it's it's what Jean Charles is, has done organically. They're using some sort of technology. Oh, of produce. course. And I even discussed that with Elena. You know, at first, Jean Charles mostly went to beaches. You know why? Longitudinal interferometry is more coherent there. And then he went to the the stasis chambers, the storage vault, the key sites, and that's also longitudinal nodes, you know, the stasis chambers. So you need a longitudinal node for send and receive accuracy. Hmm. So uh, the, what I remember was that the power output of the ship determined how far it could go. Well, so they couldn't just jump anywhere in creation. They were limited also in time. So the same exact technology gave them the ability to go a certain amount back in time or forward in time or a distance. Like they could only, let's call it a light year. Let's call it uh, six months in the future, six months in the past, or a light year in distance. And they could coordinate and go. That was the limitation of the power output of the ship and that the military ships could go much farther and instantly yeah. back. They had several mo several of the same exact motor, they would have more than one of the same motor on the ship so that they could immediately jump into an area and jump away. It was a valuable thing. Our ship was a cargo ship. We had to wait 30 minutes or so. It was less. It was 15 to 20 minutes for the ship to recharge enough power to jump again. Yeah, and there so was that implosive moment. The theory would be that the number of harmonics in the cascade that you could line up, literally harmonic inclusiveness, would predict how far you could go because it would predict how many multiples of the speed of light times C of golden ratio times C, the speed of light, you could nest coherently. So it's literally how big was the pine cones that were kissing noses. So that was determined. So they had a power up. So they had a machine that was doing that and it was determined it's, by their power output. It, it's very much like therify.net. You know, we have an RF component. We have optical uh, optical phase conjugation with the noble gases. And then we have an infrasound cascade, which is accurate phase conjugate bump wave. And if that was broader spectral, you know, we can already trigger lucid dreaming. So we just amp it up a little bit. You know, that's what a Stargate is. One more thing on the lucid dreaming is that I remembered early on that when I was on my uh, missions in Peru, when they were using me for, uh, you know, channeling information for lucid dreaming, let's call it just lucid dreaming. The first time it didn't work because I was on an airplane. They said the EMF field from the instruments. Ah, may have there you go. Then they sent down a silver blanket, a silver mesh blanket to block the EM fields and it worked. So mm -hmm. later, fast forward to now, I um, went to San Jose and talked to some scientists and I asked them about this Faraday fabric. I found a good source of it and I bought a blanket of it and I immediately, and everybody I talked to, I, I can't say everybody, but most of the people that I've referred it to sleep under these blankets and immediately just dream excuse my language, dream your ass off. Just amazingly, the, the quality of sleep and dreaming is greatly improved just well, by sleeping under this blanket. And so I, much so, days I don't sleep with it, I feel not good when I wake up. Well, I, I do have an experiment to suggest to you. You know, actually, the, the theory of optimal lucid dreaming portal stargate is not actually isolation. The theory of optimized is embedding. Now that is the opposite of your blanket. L let me see, here's here's the way you could prove what I just said. Find a cabin in a, a magical woods somewhere and try your lucid dreaming there. It should be a hundred times better than your blanket, and you don't well, need the damn blanket. <laughs> look, uh, this is this I sh I dare I say this publicly, but this is the money make to find some way to map these areas. These oh yeah. these 
these well, magnetic ley lines to find out where they're at. Well, like that's actually ancient... well, well known there. Even most governments, many governments publish magnetic maps, but they actually find the nodal cross points. It's advanced geobiology introduction, goldenmean.info slash geobiology. But basic dousing skill is survival required for every one. Because if you can't feel an earth magnetic line, you can't feel by definition, actually. It just happens that the more bliss you have, the better you can feel. <laughs> well, I'm, what I'm saying is that this greatly changes the value of real estate. <laughs> which Thank is, you. Which is, Thank you. And, this and, you greatly know, changes the value of where you are. Every ancient cathedral, every ancient labyrinth, every one of those guys, every ancient stone tower, they all knew your real estate agent doesn't, but that means they're an idiot. I'm sorry. I'm not being subtle here. But yeah, but, uh, it's okay. Sacred space is enabled communication to the array. It's even better than, you know, fiber. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah. there's, uh, again, there's homework to do after that. So, um, yeah. but so do you see that maybe we could eventually make some suggestions for trials like uh, therify.net? There's active groups doing, we have luciddreamteam.com. They're active groups doing, they'd love to be in touch with your group, I think. But there, I think so too. The people that are doing remote healing successfully now know this is not a mystery. They they get on a magnetic line cross point, send and receive point. They do it at sunrise and sunset. They use a psychotronic witness, a high res photograph, some things like that. So they're actually coupling the nodes intelligently. Because you have to, if you're going to synchronize, it's better to be in the same area where there's a mutual sunset. So we well, kind of aim. Yeah, but uh, a sunset at either end can be helpful, but there's other things that can enable compression, particularly magnetic line cross points, et cetera. Um, and obviously, you know, for the same reason that negative ion wind therapy doesn't work, if the room is full of metal and synthetics, therify plasma is the same and lucid dreaming is the same. So if you get a room with all natural everything, it's called dielectric constant. It's the definition of biologic architecture. Enables capacitive implosion, which is enables seed germination. That's how we determine which architects deserve a paycheck. Those who can make a seed grow, and that's measurable. I, I'm aware that the blanket isn't a, the um, a one. All, all it's doing is blocking out a lot of the EMF that is polluting, right. mucking it up. So it's just reducing that. I'm aware because you're only. I'm not wrapping up completely in a cage version of it. It's just. Yeah. It's just reducing. The pollution i think and yeah the, and if you were in if you were in nature, sleep quality is noticeable yeah and but what i'm saying is that in the long term insolment requires the opposite of the Faraday blanket insolment requires going to where luke skywalker did to raise the jet Connect. deep in nature <laughs> and that's, that's where you can see orbs and plasma it's living plasma and that's enabled by charge distribution efficiency the definition of heaven well and you know what if you if you research well People come to me. So since I've been public, people come to me and say, you know, Tony, I'm having all these strange things happen to me. It kind of sounds like what you went through. Let's talk about it. And what I found is that you get when you get the positive experiences, they tend to be localized in certain areas. People in Australia have a much different experience with contact, be it uh -huh. mentally or physically being taken than people in America and people in certain parts of America have a much different. They tend to have. So what I'm saying is the positive interaction with ETs or what, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is, or the positive interaction with the weirdness tends to be localized and the mm -hmm. negative interactions tend to be scattered, mm -hmm. which yeah. means it's a military that takes and picks and chooses wherever they want. And the positive ones are in tune to people that are in one of these areas that possibly yeah. could be in one of these areas. So okay. that would fall in line with what I've realized as well. So I don't tell people like, Hey, so where do you live? First question, where do you live? And then I, you know, they tell me where they live. And the first thing I know is is what's coming next is that they had a very hard time in their interactions or they had a not so bad time in their interaction. Yes. So they're, they tend to be localized. And the, the aboriginals called these song lines uh, and eventually the, the song of plasma lines became the family pet and they could talk to them. And this uh, it reminds also, also of Phil Callahan when he measured uh, uh paramagnetic diamagnetic that the if you measure the earth's ability to conduct magnetism you can predict in advance not just which village is going to be headhunters versus friendly which he did practically in the amazon but he could also predict in advance where war versus peace would break out peaceuniversity.net that's the start of the curriculum interesting 
So village A makes war on village B when somebody cuts the magnetic line, man. Wow. Oh, and that's wow. proven. It's actually been tested. PCUniversity.net. You can read the curriculum. So peace is literally defined by the neg entropy of charge distribution efficiency. And the where you start is, does the soil conduct magnetism, basically? Interesting. So it feels like homework to do. It feels like, um, like I said, I'm really interested in the the real estate versions of it. I'd like to see, I'd like to discover the areas that are that are yeah. high in this and just kind of study the history around that area. I think that would be telling. I think when you compared it with other areas yeah. that and have... Uh, yeah, and we taught physics of things. Less shui. access to for many you know, years the array. Yeah, yeah, and you know, actually, um, our friend Jan in London was Princess Diana's feng shui teacher. Actually, so feng shui is an ancient knowledge of the living nature of that grid. Actually, but you, when you convert it to physics, for example, in feng shui, a right angle is called evil. It's actually destructive to capacitive implosion. And, uh, you know, the perfect feng shui is actually the shape of the feminine body because it's actually perfected charge distribution. So it's all about living plasma, actually. And that's that's value. That is real estate value. Hmm. Anyway. Very interesting. So as usual, like I said, talking to you is taking a sip from a fire hose. It comes fast and it comes complex. Uh, but I understood. I would think I was able to digest a lot of what you talked about today. And I'm glad that stuff that I'm saying also makes perfect sense to you, too. It does. Uh, you know, that's a big step for me. Um, the fact that you were a witness is valuable. I mean, you've been there. That's valuable. I did not want to take it to the grave. When I originally got the memories back, I thought there's no way I can take all this to the grave with me. I Number one, it would drive me crazy to not speak to somebody about it. Number two, I can't see the last few minutes of my life wishing I had told everybody about everything that I remembered because it all came so quickly and there was so much of it. Um, so it just... I didn't know what I, what was going to happen back then, but I knew I had to tell people about it. And uh, the physics of Im immortality, we call it the shareable wave dot com. You're becoming a shareable wave. It's all good. Yes, uh, I do want to say this. I'll put, since I love the way that you plug all your sites as you go, I want to plug mine, TonyRodriguez dot com. And through my Patreon is where the remote view group is. There's a subscription there and it's remote viewing for, for dummies. So we're starting, and I'm not calling anybody dummies, but I'm saying we start at the beginning, somebody that knows nothing about it. And we go through the group, we're going through various techniques, not only the public stuff through the far site, but other techniques reported. And we kind of, the group meets on Zoom and we go over it and then we have targets. So you can't remote view without a blind target correctly. So you can't just say, I want to remote view and see what my ex-wife is doing with that girl. And then go in and get an accurate thing. You ha It has to be a blind target. You just, it must be blind. And the real, the real benefit of joining a remote view group is the blind targeting so that you just get a set of numbers and you do your remote view and you, that flushes out the most accuracy. So that's what we do. Uh, I want to put that, plug that out there. It's, I'm trying to get that, I'm trying to grow that group because I'm, it's just shocking the amount, the great results that we get. So we're oh, doing, I do, we, so far we're doing things like parks and, and places, you know, like rooms. I did this room and it was, it was freaky. I, I'll, I'll never do my own office or anywhere I live again because people are so accurate. It felt creepy. I felt like I was being spied upon because people were accurately describing things that's in great. my office. And so that's not going to happen again, but the remote viewing is a real thing. I think anybody can do it. It just takes a few, it just takes yes. learning the protocol and it, exp it, flexes or it it trains your intuition which we all should be using every day anyway Absolutely. Viewing is, it's not about spying it's about listening to the correct voice of intuition in your mind now, is it clutter or confetti as the far sight calls it is it mental confetti or is it your actual correct intuition and the remote viewing group lets you identify which one that is and get more in touch and if we all followed our intuition the world would be a much better place i think <laughs> Uh, well said, Tony. It's super. And you know, in the nine faces of Christ, they show the first day when you remote view or lucid dream, you could see your lover, but you couldn't smell her. But the second day you went, you had more longitudinal coherence. And on that day, you took more organs of perception with you. So there's a lot to be said about developing that emotional coherence. Like after Kundalini, I cried for a month. So you sort your emotions, and then you can propagate more coherently. And there's all that's right. And if, if when you think about it in terms like that, so this brings up another point. You think about it in terms like that, you're seeing why there's an artificial fear being instilled through all the media, through the powers that be, because they know that shuts that down for the average man. Yeah. So if you're always in a state of worry, you're worrying about like this is going to happen, the economy is going to, the end of the sky is falling, 
this and that, when you put on you put on uh, entertainment and you see gore and violence, your mind is always far away from your intuitive self, which is really what you need, what we all need. And that's so right. That's it's, an important point. So, which is, I mean, literally fearlessness. Fear is the mind killer. So we need to understand how our inner bliss responds to peace and not fear. Thank it you. was a major turning point to actually consciously say, I'm not going to be afraid of my shadow. I'm not going to be afraid of everything. And I just wanted to try that on and uh -huh. see what would happen if I wasn't angry. Because I, I, I realized I was making most of my daily decisions based on fear. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in a Thank panic. You, totally. and when I consciously let go of that, my life changed completely. And I can do nothing but recommend it for everybody. Oh, you know, there's a certain amount of fear that makes sense. Like, obviously, I'm not going to walk on a ledge and make my YouTube of me jumping over to high high altitudes because i'm afraid of falling for one but i'm saying like day-to-day -day decisions and nurturing fear is the wrong wrong thing to do across yes. the board so you're literally following your own bliss tony you're a great example here i'm i'm really delighted to work with you well said thank Good. you uh i think we got more to do i think we got more to do but we should probably wrap up because this is a lot to yeah. ingest and i can't wait to watch this over <laughs> thank you tony it's been a blessing thanks for being here thanks for being a shareable wave and being so having so much integrity when you shared your memory tony really i i congratulate you i didn't know what to expect so uh, so far and like i said that was the moment i said i look i i'm going to talk about this and i'm not going to be afraid of what happens because i did put myself out there for a lot of abuse oh. and uh it panned out so uh -huh. uh, it's just i just think it's more important than me um getting the abuse so a I real walking hero <laughs> thank you tony bless I wouldn't take that but um <laughs> that was my motivation is what i'm saying he's following his bliss folks thank you <laughs> talk again soon tony i love doing this you betcha dan thank you terrible blessings bye-bye